Welcome to Jazz Zone Together, our online jazz community where we will provide jazz education resources, interviews with jazz educators, artists, and celebrities, along with valuable tips and repertoire suggestions. Today, we welcome to Jazz Zone Together, one of the most highly renowned trumpet players in the world, also a composer, educator, band leader, and activist, and recent past president of Jen, Sean Jones. Now I'll turn the mic over to Dick Dunscombe to conduct the interview <laughs> with Sean. Dick, take it away. Thank you, Bob. Oh, what a pleasure this is. We've been wanting this interview for so long and we finally caught up with Sean Jones on the road. Welcome, Sean. Thank you so much, Dick. Great to be here. Thank you both for having me. It's been fa it's fantastic to be here. Great. I know from past experiences that uh, you've got a lot to share, and we've got a lot of time to talk about that. But first, let's begin at the beginning. How did you get started in music, and what led you to pursue music and music education as a career? Well, I, I got started in music and really in the church. I'm, I'm from a small town in Warren, Ohio. That's right outside of Akron, Ohio, outside of Cleveland. And basically what you did in that town is you did a couple of different things. All of the adults worked at the steel mill or the uh, auto factory uh, for General Motors. And when they weren't working, they were in church or some kind of... Uh, some kind of local, uh, I don't know, lo local, uh, you know, place to galvanize their their collective ideas like that. There wasn't much music going on outside of the church. So every week, you know, I'd find myself singing in the choir or trying to play drums. But uh, very soon uh, after trying to play the drums, I realized that my right hand didn't like what my left hand, my left foot was doing. So, <laughs> um, so I stuck with singing. And then around the fifth grade, I was 10 years old, uh, I discovered the trumpet. And I fell in love with the trumpet because it was very difficult. And I was sort of a nerd. I was a little different kid. And I liked the fact that it was going to be a challenge for life. And so I just started to check that out. And then lucky, lucky for me, I had a teacher that noticed that I really liked the challenge of the trumpet. And she took me to a lo local pizzeria. And as I'm stuffing my face with pizza, she gave me two albums. One of them was Miles Davis' Kind of Blue. And the other one was Miles Davis' Tutu. And I took those albums home and that was it. I didn't realize that I was going to be performing and making this a, a vocation or turning this into a career. I just knew I loved it. And I knew that it was something that I could uh, sort of spend my time doing because I had the challenge. I was a, a, a weird kid anyway, so I, I didn't really have a bunch of friends at school. So I liked the fact that I could just sit there and practice all day long. And the more I practiced, the more I got into it, the, more, and the harder it became the more I loved it. And then when I got a little older, I started to find my tribe and I would take the instrument to church and, and try to improvise with the organist at the church and things like that. And I ended up in college and I went to, I went to Youngstown State University. I studied classical trumpet. I actually do not have a jazz degree at all. Um, studied classical trumpet and I would went on to move to New Jersey and I went to Rutgers University and that's kind of where it all began there in terms of my professional career. And um, I wouldn't change the journey one bit. So what was, what was the key at Rutgers? What, what was the impetus there? One individual. Well, actually two. I shouldn't say that. Uh, it, regarding the trumpet specifically, it was Professor William Filder. We affectionately called him Prof. Prof was one of the greatest jazz trumpet, well, I would say trumpet pedagogues that ever lived. He studied with uh, Vincent Chikowitz, who was the second trumpet player in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in the 50s under Fritz Reiner. And so he studied with him 
And he also indirectly studied with Adolf Herseth, who was the principal trumpet player, Chicago Symphony, during that time. And they took a liking to Prof, and Prof became the first African-American uh, principal trumpet of the Chicago Civic Orchestra in the 50s. And so Prof went on to become a great pedagogue, taking some of their secrets. And he taught Wynton Marcellus, Terrence Blanchard, Terrell Stafford, the list goes on and on. And I was one of his last students. So that's how that all happened. And also at Rutgers University were really two other professors that had a profound influence on my life. Um, really three, I guess you would say. Um, but in order of the most profound influence, I would say, was Stanley Cowell, who's an amazing pianist, as we all know. He was really like a big brother to me. Ralph Peterson, who was definitely like a big brother, and I would eventually playing, uh, eventually end up performing in his band. And also Ralph Bowen. And if you know anything about the music of the 80s, the jazz music in the 80s, there was a wonderful group that was called OTB, or Out of the Blue. And Ralph Peterson and Ralph Bowen were in that band together, and they ended up being both being professors at Rutgers. And so I was able to study with all of those folks. And they really uh, sort of took this gritty kid from the country, Warren, Ohio, and really uh, give me a certain level of sophistication. So I thank them a lot for what, what I'm doing now in my career. So we know your experience with the Lincoln Center Orchestra. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. How did you get there? Wow, I don't know if we have enough time. <laughs> that's oh, we got that's a long story, you know. <laughs> and and um, I'll say this. It, it was a series of risks that I took, calculated risk. And I, and I share this with students all the time. You know, we live in a time period where everybody wants to hide behind these screens. And, and I tell students, you know, if you don't get out there and, and go and create opportunities and find opportunities, sometimes you got to drive 30, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours away. And I tell them my story. And part of my story is this specific story in that there was one day where I heard about this jam session that was happening in Columbus, Ohio. Now, at the time, I was studying at Youngstown State University. And Youngstown is about two and a half hours away from Columbus. Now, I was driving this beat-up Chevy Beretta <laughs> at the time. And it had a, flo a hole in the floor. And they used to call it the Flintstone car. <laughs> and I had <laughs> I had just enough gas to get from Youngstown to Columbus, but not back. Just enough <laughs> gas to get there. And I thought to myself, I said, okay, at this jam session, uh, there was supposed to be Wes Anderson there, who was the lead alto player for uh, Winton at the time. And so I thought to myself, do I want to risk this and go down to this thing and get stuck? And without hesitation, I said, yes, risk it. <laughs> so I drove down there. My gas was gas was on me, and I went in, went into the uh, the jam session. And Ferez with it, great trumpet player out of uh, Illinois, now living in Chicago, and Derek Gardner were both there playing. Derek Gardner of the Basie Band and other other things, and also an alum of Rutgers University. They were there playing on caravan and they they knew me. They motioned me to come up to the stage and we got in this heated trumpet battle. And Wes <laughs> Anderson takes his phone, cell phone out and he holds his phone up and he's laughing. I said, why is this guy laughing like this? What, what are we doing? So we walk off the stage after the heated exchange, friendly fire, if you will. And Wes Anderson says, hey, man. Take the phone. Talk to who's on the other line. I said, okay, sure. I grabbed the phone. I said, hello, who's this? And on the other line, I hear this voice. Hey, man, you sound good, man. You sound real nice. I said, okay, well, who's this? It's Whitten Marcellus, he says. I said, <laughs> yeah, right. And I hung up the phone. <laughs> so Wes says, hey, man, why'd you hang up the phone? I said, that's not Whitten Marcellus. And he says, I'm going to call him back, talk to him. So he called him back. I said, hello? He says, hey, man, why'd you hang up the phone with me? I said, come on, you got to prove to me that it's Wynton Marcellus. And then the next thing I hear is this blistering trumpet on the other line. 
And I'm freaking out, of course. This young hothead, you know, oh, my God, Mr. Marcellus. Oh, my God, it's so great to meet you. He said, take my phone number down and call me when you get to New York. And I said, okay. Fast forward a year and a half. I ended up at Rutgers University in Jersey, right across the, the Hudson River, if you will. And I was talking to a friend of mine who, who actually passed away shortly after that. Uh, she was a track star. And uh, she told me, she said, you know, Sean, you told me the story about uh, meeting Wynton Marcellus on the phone. And I said, yeah, yeah. She said, did you ever call him? And I said, no. Next thing I know, she's running down the street with my phone. Now, I weighed about 70 more pounds than what I weigh now. <laughs> so there's no way I'm catching this track star. She's already up the street on my phone. This was before you could lock the phones, you know on my phone, and she's calling, found Winton's number, called Winton, and he picked up the phone. <laughs> so she's talking to Winton Marcellus, and she gives me the phone. She runs back, gives me the phone, and Winton says, hey, man, I heard you've been living out in New Jersey, man. How come you haven't called me? I said, oh, I don't want to bother you. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. So Winton says, get on the train and get up to New York right now. So I'm like, Mr. Marcellus, I got a final tonight. I got to school, all this excuses, you know. He says, I don't care. Come on up and, and, and meet me for a few hours and we'll hang out. So that's what I did. Told you it was a long story. So I got on, <laughs> I got on the train and I went on up there and I went to his beautiful penthouse at, at, at the Lincoln Center complex at the time. And I walk into the living room and there's Aaron Goldberg. Carlos Enriquez, Aaron Goldberg, great pianist. Mm -hmm. Carlos Enriquez on the bass and Ali Jackson on drums, a whole rhythm section. And Winton is playing chess with his sound man. And he didn't even look up. He says, sit down over there. And they start rehearsing between while he's playing chess. Hour goes by, two hours go by, three hours go by. And I say, Mr. Marcellus, I got to get back and take this test or I'm going to fail. And he says, all right, pull your horn out. Let's play something. Pull my horn out. We start playing something. About another 10 minutes goes by and we're talking. And the phone rings. It was Ryan Kaiser. <laughs> Ryan Kaiser proceeds to tell Winton that he can't make the summer tour. He mentioned three trumpet players that could have subbed for him on this tour. I was the third one. Went and looked over at me and said, what are you doing this summer? I said, well, I guess I'm on the road with you. So I went on the road with Jazz and Lincoln Center for that summer, took a subbing for Ryan Kaiser. At the end of the tour, he asked me to be his lead trumpet player. And then history was made at that point. So I say that long story, and I and I take pride in saying that because I've there's a, there's been a series of calculated risks that I've taken throughout my life. I was just crazy enough to believe that I belong in this industry and, and, and around these giants. Uh, not because I feel that I'm so great, but because I'm, I was willing to do the work and I'm still willing to do the work. And I'm trying to spread that to the young people in education now. Thanks. Sean, that's, that's a beautiful story. And, and what a lesson for those people listening in. You know, our, our audience is jazz professionals, jazz educators, heavily jazz educators. Yeah. And I know you're familiar with that arena. But oh, before yeah. we go there, you then became a member of the San Francisco Jazz Collective. What's that all about? Wow. Well, you know, it was, after I left Jazz and Lincoln Center, I was actually in Marcus Miller's band for a while. Talk about doing something completely different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was in Marcus Miller's band for about four years, four and a half years. We did a couple records and we did this tour with Herbie and Wayne commemorating Miles. And then after that, I got into the SF Jazz Collective. And the reason that I got into the collective, uh, other than them inviting me in, was that it's a collection of eight composers. And there's no leader of that band. Basically, what happens is everyone's responsible for bringing two charts to the table, one arrangement of a chosen composer and one original composition. And when you're rehearsing that music, you're the leader. 
And so I wanted to learn from these other amazing musicians. But one, one in particular uh, I was really thinking about, and that's Miguel Zanon. I've been watching Miguel Zanon for years. And I was always fascinated by what he could come up with and also his level of discipline. So I wanted to stand next to this guy. And I learned from him every single day. And also realized that everyone in that band had, was a genius and on their own. I mean, you know, you got David Sanchez was in that band, Edward Simon on piano, Warren Wolf, who's like, I don't know, he's like one of the X-Men. <laughs> like he can do anything. Um, Robert, uh, excuse me, no, um uh, uh on trombone was um oh geez, who was, was um Robin Eubanks was on mm. trombone, uh, on drums, Obed Calvair and Matt Penman on bass. And each one of them just had a varying level of of uh, of genius, and I learned so much from them going on the road with them. But like every band I've ever been in, I'll only stay in the band for about four or five years because I believe in what went uh, with uh, what Miles Davis said. He says you can't get comfortable, so I'm constantly looking for the next learning experience to put myself inside of an uncomfortable situation so I can grow. And I'm still doing that to this day. So let's go there. You've performed with many jazz icons throughout the years. Once again, for our listeners, how were those experiences, both as a concert situation and in the recording studio? Wow. You know, for some reason, some of these legends, they trusted me early on in life. And um, maybe I was just naive enough <laughs> or respectful enough to bring what the best of what I could at the at the moment to the table. And, the, and one of the first people to really trust me was Gerald Wilson. Mm -hmm. And um and I get I, I get emotional thinking about him because he came to Cleveland, Ohio and was a guest artist with the Cleveland Jazz Orchestra where I was playing in. And at the end of his run, the week the week run, he said, Sean, the next album I do, I'm gonna put you on it. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, okay, Mr. Wilson, you know, I'm thinking it's Hollywood talk. You know, he lives in California. <laughs> sure enough, he did an album called New York New Sound, where he came to New York and uh, he he brought together some of the best musicians in New York City to be in the band. And he called me up to be on that band. I, in fact, he had John Faddis call me, who is also a mentor of mine. And Mr. Faddis said, he said, Sean, Mr. Wilson wants you on this album. Be here at this point in time. And I have to tell y'all, I walked in that studio. I saw Tootie Heath. No, excuse me. No, I saw I saw Jimmy Heath. I saw Frank West, mm -hmm. Louis Nash, Rene Rosnes. Uh, John Faddis was in the trumpet section. Jimmy Owens in the trumpet section. Uh, uh, the doc, doc was in the uh, trumpet section. Eddie, Eddie, uh, Henderson was in that trumpet section. And, you know, I saw all these luminaries. Bob Crenshaw was on bass. I mean, I, I, I literally walked in there and I said, I don't, I don't belong here. And I started to turn around. And John, God bless him, he, he followed me out the room and he said, what are you doing? I said, Mr. Faddis, I said, I said, Faddis, I don't, I don't belong here, man. You got all these great musicians. He said, if Mr. Wilson calls you, you belong here get your so-and-so back up in there, <laughs> pull out that horn and be great. <laughs> so I pull out the horn and they were doing one of the charts that Mr. Wilson wanted to do. He wanted to uh, perform or redo Viva Torado, which is like one of his big hits, you know, mm -hmm. and that's been covered a few times. And um, Jimmy Owens was also on the hit, who was the original trumpet player to play the solo on it. And, and Jimmy was getting ready to play the solo. And and Gerald cut off the band. He said, oh, Jimmy, you already had your turn. I want Sean to play this solo. <laughs> and so I played the solo. And that's how I got my recording contract with Mac Avenue Records. <laughs> one solo. So I'm really thankful for that opportunity from Mr. Wilson. Also, Jimmy Heath, I played in his band for a while. <clears throat> uh, before all of them, I played in... Uh, Illinois Jaquette's band. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is the Illinois band, he was a tyrant. You know, we would go to his uh his his 
<laughs> we go to his house in Jamaica Plains, and and he always called rehearsals at the most inopportune time. It was like during rush hour. It's like not be it be there at nine o'clock, and then the <laughs> rehearsal would get over at four thirty. <laughs> so it's like it, it took you like three hours to get there and three hours to leave. So it was all day thing. And um, and Illinois would call me the gorilla. He never called me by my first name. <laughs> he said, gorilla, solo, let it be. You know, and so I kind of got the hazing treatment from him. And so that that was cool. Other mentors, Marcus Miller was a great mentor of mine. Um, got to hang with Herbie and Wayne. And and I'm just really thankful that these these legends really trusted me with their music. And um, I understand now why they they had me in their bands. They know that my passion is education. Actually, I never wanted to be on the road. I just wanted to be one of the teachers in the classroom that had the respect of the players. So I just wanted to make sure that I could at least function on their level. And so when I needed some advice or when I need to bring them into the classroom, I'd be able to call them up. But I realized after a while, if I wanted their respect, I had to be on the road with them. <laughs> so now I'm kind of focusing most of my attention on uh, education. You know, Sean, your name belongs right up beside every one of those that you mentioned. And we all know that today. Oh, thank you. So, so, so let's, let's go into jazz education. You're the Jazz Studies Chair at the Peabody Institute in Baltimore. Take us for a deeper look into that program and, and your students. Well, there's a little history there. Um, the Peabody Conservatory or Peabody Institute was founded in the middle 1800s. I think it was 1865. It is the oldest conservatory in the United States. Hmm. Um, about, <clears throat> excuse me, about six years ago, their jazz department was on the decline for several reasons. And um, I was uh, asked to be a consultant to look into the solvency of the program. And so I uh, mentioned to the dean at the time, uh, after completing the uh, consultation, what I felt would be a way to right the ship, if you will. I didn't know he was going to ask me to take the job <laughs> at the end. And so <clears throat> they asked me, they sent, they sent a message saying, would you be interested in this position? And I, I, I reading the email, I started to think about another mentor was Donald Byrd. Mm -hmm. Donald Byrd told me something at Birdland when I went to see him uh, perform one of his last performances. He told me, he said, Sean, you got to understand if you want to really be effective as an educator, you have to go where the work needs to be done, not where the work is being done. And so I remember those words and I thought about it. I was sitting in my office at the Berkeley College of Music, riding high. You know, I'm at Berkeley. Everything is wonderful at Berkeley. It's a gigantic machine. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh my God, why do I feel this calling in the pit of my stomach. And I told myself, okay, Sean, if you're worth your salt, you're gonna go down there and at least try it. So I went down there, started off with six students. We now have almost 70 students. We have a fully funded master's degree. First time they've ever had a jazz master's degree. We're performing in the community. Our scholarship rate is high, the highest it's ever been. <clears throat> and we have community support. And I'm not saying that because I'm so great. I'm saying it because I was willing to listen to the call. I was willing to listen to the difficult things. In fact, I wrote my obituary, <laughs> which is all about that. Well, I mm -hmm. believe that the calling on my life is to do what is difficult. And I'm going to continue to do that. Wow. That is some stuff man and <laughs> and you're enjoying it right i am you know i really am and it's 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 even though it's hard it's it's, it's kind of like going to the gym right nobody wants to go to the gym <laughs> <laughs> but when you go you know you're going to feel better when it's done and that's that's kind of how i how uh how i've designed my life 
you know. And uh, I, I just want to read this to you, if I, if I may. What I mentioned was my was my obituary, not to sound morbid or anything, but I think about this because it directs my decisions. Mm -hmm. It says the call on my life has been to do the hard things, the hard things with pain, nothing making sense, and with grit. Most of all, in the spirit of love connected to the eternal consciousness that gives me the fight to endure and enjoy it all. And that's how I want to live my life. I want to feel like every day, I want to feel like I want to be tired at the end of the day, knowing that I tried my best. Those are beautiful words, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. You were the president, and just recently, um, as the president of JEN, Jazz Educators Network, yes. talk about the work of that organization and how, how you've been able to impact jazz directors and their students. Speaking of hard things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know about that. <laughs> yeah, Jen, Jen is a wonderful organization, the Jazz Education Network, founded by two individuals, Mary Jo Papich, wonderful educator out of Chicago, and Dr. Lou Fisher, who's a wonderful educator as well, recently retired. And uh, they basically got together after IAJE, the International Association of Jazz Education, after that went south <clears throat> and they said to themselves, we need to do something here. We need to have some other organization that supports educators and gives them jazz educators specifically and gives them an opportunity to coalesce around a conference. And so that's what they did now, 11, 12 years ago. Well, Mary Jo, God bless her, came up to me. <laughs> in 2017 asked me to be on the board and after that she gave me a uh she basically told me she says hey Sean um why don't you consider being president and I said oh my gosh here we go again <laughs> the hard things and so I decided that I was going to be the president of the Jazz Education Network and I had all these ideas y'all all these ideas. I said, okay, it's my turn. <clears throat> I'm going to be the president starting in 2019 and going to 2021. Actually, no, 2020 is when I started. Well, we all know what happened in 2020. All hell broke loose in the world and the pandemic happened. And what I thought I was going to be able to do actually shifted to pivoting pivoting into creating a completely online conference. We did over a hundred concerts and presentations over the course of four days that lasted from 9 a.m. until 1 a.m. each day for four days. And we also pivoted from being a solely conference-driven organization to offering content throughout the year. So it was a pretty exciting time for me to be able to pivot that way. And I also learned, you know, that when you're a leader, you become a target. So, <laughs> so during that time, there were protests against uh, the organization going to various places, one of them being Texas because of the political climate, X, Y, and Z. And so I said, well, you know, we got to go down there to Texas because the politics of Texas are not the people of Texas, Right. And that's everywhere, whether it's New York or whatever, everybody has something to say about the politics. Well, jazz, in my view, supersedes politics. So, so I went down there to do the best I could. And I'm, I'm thankful that the organization is still growing in its membership and it's diversifying as well. So I'm happy to have done my part. <clears throat> and you did it very well. Thank you so, so much. As a, so as a jazz educator, give us your perspective on the health of jazz music and jazz education. I think it's alive and well. I'm actually out here on the road with the Herbie Hancock Institute peer-to-peer yeah. -peer, um, band, and it's all high school students, and we're in Virginia, and we're going from high school to high school teaching the young people at these high schools. So the, the young group of musicians that are out here, they're some of the best in the country. And they're sitting in the bands with these with these young people playing. And, and it's it's really, really fantastic and really beautiful. And so <clears throat> I'm I'm excited for that. And also I lead the National Youth Orchestra, which I mentioned earlier. 
Uh, so the, there are 16 to 19 euros that's out of Carnegie Hall, and we're going to Europe with Dee Dee Bridgewater this summer. And there are just college uh, jazz ensemble programs all over the country, all over the world, really. And, um, you know, Herbie Hancock has the uh, the Jazz Institute. He's a UNESCO uh, jazz and uh, music goodwill ambassador, if you will. And jazz education and jazz presentations on International Jazz Day a couple of years ago reached over a billion people. A billion with a B. So there are those that say that, you know, jazz is dead or this is this and, you know, and 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 those are you know if you want to talk about the the word jazz yes there are some there was there are some egregious things in the beginning but <clears throat> like most things they evolve and i think that oops sorry about that i think that the music has evolved over time and the people that are involved in the music have evolved and i think it's important for this country at some point to recognize that jazz is the answer to a lot of all of our problems because jazz is the greatest representation of democracy because it affords for it allows for individual freedom but with respect to the group you can do whatever you want you play whatever you want on your solo but it has to be about the overall eleva elevation of the entire band and so if we actually taught our young people about the blues we taught our young people about jazz the value of listening the value of communicating the value of sparring a little bit, friendly fire, if you will, then I really believe that through the sound of the nation, the healing of the nation will take place. That's a strong message. And I've heard you deliver it before, Midwest Clinic. And it was so well received by the 800, 900 people that were in the audience at that time. Wonderful. You know, you should consider... Um, you should consider maybe bringing your band to Midwest sometime. I would love that. We we actually brought my band to uh to Gen the 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 Gen conference in 2018, so that's a good idea. And actually, uh, the Peabody Big Band will be at the Midwest Clinic uh, this year, so stay tuned for that. We're really yes. excited to bring. Yeah, them. yeah, we are too. We are too. Well, Sean, this has been absolutely wonderful. It's it's just such a pleasure to share you and your joy with our listeners today. And Thank like you. you said at the beginning, you know, the trumpet chose you and you took it from there to the very top of the line. Thank you, man. Thank you, brothers. It's great to see you. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, just wonderful perspective on... Uh, how you got where you are and why. To our viewers, thanks for watching. We hope you gained some valuable insights from the interview with Sean. Please view our interviews in the series to learn more about the interviewees and their contributions to music education.